Schönen guten Abend aus Düsseldorf, aus Seattle und aus New York. Das digitale Quartett ist nach einer kleinen Pause wieder da. Und ähm, zum zweiten Mal werden wir heute eine Sendung in Englisch machen. Ähm, wir hatten das ja schon einmal, dass Jeff Jarvis sich spontan zugeschaltet hat. Ähm, heute ist es durchaus bewusst so, dass wir äh, einen amerikanischen Gast da haben. Und wir sagen, äh, welcome Clive Thompson. Uh, Hi. Clive is uh, a really renowned tech journalist um, working for um, such small publications as Wired and the New York Times Magazine. Um, and he also wrote a book which uh, made me stumble upon him. Um, Clive, how is the title? It's a bit long. Sure. It's, it's, it's called Smarter Than You Think, How Technology is Changing Our Minds for the Better. So it, it, it's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, also with us is uh, Ulrike Langer from Seattle. Um, guten Abend, Ulrike. Guten, guten Abend nach Düsseldorf, Thomas. And hi, Clive. Hi. Um, Clive, uh, when, uh, I, I suppose you don't read that much German media, but um, in, in German media your book looks, looks like the exact counterpart to what uh, most classical media is publishing in Germany. So I have to ask you, do you know Evgeny Morozov? Oh yes, in fact I, I, uh, I wrote about his latest book for my Wired column uh, at the beginning of this year, 2013, um, to save everything click here, uh, which, which, which I quite liked a lot of it actually. Um, and, and I cite uh, his book, his previous book, The Net Delusion, in, um, in my uh, uh, in my book, when I talk about the political chapter, I sort of point out some of the, the ways that he was very uh, instrumental in noting the fact that authoritarian governments, you know, love modern technology. We can talk more about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I know of his stuff, and I, I actually quite like a lot of his writing. He reviewed my book uh, for a British newspaper, I can't remember, and it was, uh, as I joked at the time on Twitter, the most pleasant Uh, um, pan, uh, uh, the, the most pleasant rebuke of my book that I'd ever seen him write. Uh, <laughs> he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he was extremely pleasant uh, in, in his disagreement with me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of his work for sure. Well, that's at least more than Jeff Jarvis can say of his, re his rebuttals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the, famous, uh, the famous injunction, this is a book that should have remained a tweet, uh, was uh, his, his takeaway for, uh, for public parts, I think it was Jeff Jarvis's public parts, yeah. Um, sometimes we in Europe have the feeling that the whole debates about uh, the internet is changing our society, uh, at, le at least in classical media, pretty one-sided to the internet skeptics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that's just a European thing or uh, is it in America as well? Well, I, I, no, I think it's true here in America because what you see here uh, in the U.S. is that there is um, there, there's this big divide in, in how people talk about technology. So um, on, on the East Coast in, and, in, and in large media, traditional industrial media, newspapers, uh, uh, television, um, there's an awful lot of, of Uh, concern and skepticism and sense that uh, this is really a bad thing uh, um, and whereas on the west coast in the in the technology sector in, in Silicon Valley there is a, um, a sort of very very knee-jerk um, simple boosterism rah-rah everything about the internet is fantastic and this you know constant belief that um, that you know dis destruction of industries is always a good thing uh, um, so it, it's very divided right you know like if you, if you paid attention to the um, to the, the East Coast media, uh, you would read nothing but a series of very gloomy uh, pronunciations about the effect of, of, of the internet and digital tools on society. And on the West Coast, you would get the exact opposite. You'd get never, never any critical words, you know, most of it. It's just, it's, everyone's just obsessed with talking about some new app and whether they're going to make a million dollars, you know, that, that's, as, that's as deep as it goes. Do you see this as an as a as a cultural divide between the East and the West Coast? The East Coast as the yeah. um, as the intellectualism, and West Coast has this can do, will do, will do <laughs> attitude. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. It, it's not just can do; it's will do. It's like if we can do it, we will do it, and you know, we'll just you know let whatever happens happens. Um, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, I live here in New York City, so I'm sort of surrounded by. The, um, the sort of more gloomy, more cautious, um, uh, pessimistic view. I think that's one of the reasons why 
I wrote my book is I don't feel entirely comfortable in either milieu. Um, I I I don't uh, I, I don't think the very gloomy pronunciations about the internet really match reality. I mean, I'm a reporter, so I'm always talking to people and observing things, and I just simply, uh, my view over the last 20 years, actually it got more optimistic as time went on. We can talk about that. But it, it didn't really match the sort of constant parade of op-ed articles talking about people being shallow and narcissistic and trivial. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't live in Silicon Valley, and I I, I find the uh, a lot of the press that is constantly just sort of reporting on technology as if it were a horse race, and the most important thing is whether company A is going to beat out company B. I could sort of care less, right? I, I'm interested in the social impact of these things, and uh, there, there's there's less conversation about that out there. So I, I've always tried in my journalism <coughs> to find some way to talk about this intelligently to intelligent people who who don't, you know, who, who are dissatisfied with both of those Manichaean opposites. I think that's really interesting in your biography because you were a skeptic at first as well. Yes. Uh, what made you change your mind? Uh, it was really the reporting that I did. Uh, I mean, I started, um, I, 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 when I was a kid, so I, I grew up, I'm 45, so I grew up as part of that first generation of kids that um, that had little computers that you plugged into televisions, you know, like the Commodore 64, the, the Sinclair ZX100. I'm assuming you, you guys probably had a whole bunch locally made in Germany too. And, uh, and that was in the 70s and early 80s, and you had to learn how to program to use them. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. I was a very geeky kid. I thought, wow, computers are powerful, and I can imagine them having a big impact on society. But I went to college and I studied university and I studied um, political science and English because I wanted to be a writer. I didn't study technology stuff, but I kept on reading about it because I was very interested in it. And then when I graduated in the early 90s, I um, there wasn't really much journalism work. It was quite a recession in Canada. It was very bad. I'm from Canada originally, and um, and so I couldn't really find any work. I actually ended up working as a literary organizer for the League of Canadian Poets, uh, uh, organizing poetry readings. Um, and then slowly I turned into a freelance writer, and that was when the internet was just becoming mainstream in the 90s. So I said, well. This this is super interesting because now we'll get to see how these networks and how these computational devices affect society en masse. And I said, I want to report about this. But I was 25 years old, and like most 25-year-old men, I thought I had everything figured out. You know, uh, uh, and and if you'd asked me, I would have said, Wow, I think the average person is 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 too stupid, you know, to be allowed on the internet. And uh, and all this online conversation will degrade into trivia and gossip and crap, and it's going to be awful. Um, that's what I thought. But um, but because I'm a reporter. Uh, I write long magazine pieces, and, and they're they're reported in in what people are actually doing. Every time a new technology came along, like um, you know something as simple as Hotmail, uh, and then instant messaging, and then text messaging, or maybe you know uh, Flickr and digital photography, I would go out and I would talk to dozens and dozens of people and find out what they were actually doing. And I would talk to academics who were studying it, and uh, and I, almost every time I discovered that people were were more creative and more interesting and using these technologies to do uh, 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 funny, surprising, creative things that I would never have predicted. You know, so so I was right about some things. I mean, I, I think when you look at most newspapers, the comments are so dreadful that it's obvious that you know the internet has uncorked uh, um, uh, some of the stupidest expression imaginable. Um, although I think we can talk more about why I think that's a problem very specific to newspapers. Um, you know, so I, you could see some of the bad stuff emerge, but I, I completely failed to predict uh, all the good stuff. I, I failed to predict Wikipedia. I failed to predict <coughs> the ways in which you know activists have 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 been given amazing new powers to challenge authority. Uh, I I didn't understand the, the fact that once people were allowed to publish, it would really uncork all these fascinating human passions that had been hidden for the last couple hundred years because the, the average person was unable to communicate about the things that they were interested in. So so really what happened is I just, the more I reported, the more I saw what people were actually doing, uh, the less confident I was in my gloomy little opinions that I had sitting at my desk. Uh, um, and uh, and eventually I, I, I came around to the idea that there was, uh, there was many more good things happening than I could have ever foreseen. Now, the subtitle of your book is How Technology is Changing Our Minds for the Better, and I think we have to do one definition here. Do you uh, write about the mind or the brain? 
<laughs> I write about that. That's, that's a great distinction. I write about the mind. I don't write about the brain. I, I, I use the, the, mind, the, the word mind very specifically because um, – you know, one of the things I also wrote the book about was it. Had, I, there had been in the in the kind of around 2005 to 2007 or 8, there had been this explosion of writing in, in the in the popular press about uh, uh, how the mind works, based on you know brain scanning studies. And there had been these attempts to try and say that wow, because we can now see the brain, we can understand the brain. Um, and even though there'd really only been like one or maybe two brain scanning studies that looked at technology. Um, they were used as a jumping off point to say that wow we can we understand how the brain works and technology is is dreadful for it so when i when I started my book, I thought well you know uh, i want I want to investigate this in fact actually my my uh, my proposal for my book uh, um, listed a chapter in which I said i 'm going to talk about the brain science and the neuroscience of how the brain works and i 'm going to investigate how technology affects it uh, but I spent months and months researching that, and I became convinced that it was far too premature to say anything about this. Uh, um, that the types of things I was interested in were very complicated mental uh, processes. You know, creativity, memory, insight, uh, uh, social thinking, social feeling, social collaboration. These are really complicated things that you know, serious neuroscientists agree we don't understand at all how they work. Uh, most of the time, we're still figuring this out, and so it was incredibly premature. I think it's premature for any journalist that you see to be talking about uh, the neuroscience of the brain. Um, so I wanted to stick to something that was fuzzier. Uh, but more knowable, which was, you know, what does our observable patterns and habits of mind look like? You know, and now we're talking more about the mind, not about the brain. You know, what do our what do our mental habits look like? What does our mental what's the quality of our cultural production? You know, what are the observable social science aspects uh, of of how we how we relate? That's that's how I sort of um, focused around that. But it, it took a lot of work. It, it was it was different from what I expected to do. I thought I was going to go in talking about the brain, and I realized no, I can only talk about the mind. Well, you would be the only one, apart from um, a German uh, called Manfred Spitzer, who thinks he has uh, detected uh, brain differences uh, due to the internet. Um, oh, yeah. But that's actually scientifically unproven. And um, mm. But talking about the brain, um, do you see the web as... Uh, part of outsourcing our brain, and sure. I'm, I'm deliberately talking about the brain right now. Sure, sure, so sure, sure. We have all yeah. this collective wisdom where we can tap into uh, wherever and whenever we are. Um, what does that do to us? Is, is that good for us? Sure, sure. Well, um, th th there's a couple ways to think about this. One of them is that uh, the, uh, I, I used to be a little, uh, when I started the book, I was a little uh, uneasy, I suppose, at, at, the, at the idea that people were... Um, were regularly reaching for these online resources to find things out and to answer questions. And I thought, well, is this a corrosion of our the memory and knowledge inside our brains, right? You know? Um, and But the more I looked at the history of human thought and the way that we use uh, cognitive tools, you know, things to help us think, uh, the more I realized that, um, you know, a huge amount of our thinking already happens in concert, uh, in very intimate concert with all sorts of resources outside of our head. Like, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, um, uh, like the Augusto Rodin, the thinker. You know, uh, that, 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 that's our metaphor for what, we, for what we think thinking is. You know, it's sitting there quietly, alone, isolated, just you and your brain, and that is what thinking is. But th that is, uh, that's a completely misleading metaphor. Um, a huge amount of our thinking happens um, in concert with tools. I mean, look at all these books behind me and all these books behind you guys. You know, that is, like, you know, Socrates when writing came along, he was ex incredibly worried uh, that it would degrade our knowledge and our wisdom because if stuff was written down, that we would not need to memorize it, and if it wasn't memorized in our heads, how could you possibly call it knowledge, right? Uh, and of course, he was right. You know, he, this is what he said in his dialogue, the Phaedrus. Uh, um, uh, that it would it'd create forgetfulness in men's souls, and uh, and he wasn't wrong. I mean, once we were able to write things down, we 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 stopped practicing the mental habit of memorizing everything. Um, but what he failed to understand, of course, was that when you can externalize knowledge and you can reconsult it, um, you can you can sort of ponder a greater array 
of knowledge and wisdom and culture and thought than you could ever do unassisted by yourselves. And this is the history over and over of technology, that we find new ways to externalize and, and, and ponder and reaccess uh, our knowledge. And, so, and, and the issue of reaccess is a big deal because every time we get a new technology for externalizing and, 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 and setting knowledge down, it creates a new explosion of stuff and we freak out about it because we have no idea how we're going to reaccess this stuff, no idea how we're going to um, you know, uh, separate the, the authoritative and the good from the crap. Uh, and we had that problem with books. It took hundreds of years for them to turn books into um, a, a useful cognitive tool. I mean, the early books had no paragraph breaks. They had no they, they had no page numbers. They had no indexes. You know, you could sort of read the book, but it was there was no way to go back and find something again. It took years for them, decades for them to to, to sort of turn it into a, a, a the the very supple and useful cognitive tool we have today. And then it took you know centuries more to develop libraries and public libraries and the idea that we need to make this something that that any citizen can go and consult on their own because for for hundreds of years a librarian was what was the only one who knew where the books were so there was this bottleneck you walked up to a library and can I get that book and you had to wait for them to go and physically find the book because there was no organization to those books you know then John, you know, the Dewey decimal system comes along Melville Dewey comes along and he creates a taxonomy for organizing books and so over and over we, we, we do this to ourselves we come up with new things we had the telegraph that created new forms of knowledge that we had to organize newspapers became the way that we organize telegraphic knowledge and now we're in the middle of this reorganization again so so in some respects uh, the, the most startling thing for me was how much of our thinking happens in this in this sort of cognitive dance uh, uh, with with things around us ranging from the computer to the book to the post-it note and even more strangely and this is this is the weird one um, with other people right because you know again we think of we think of our thought as being something that's autonomous to us but um, a huge amount of our thinking happens in the real world socially with other people. You know, we, we rely on the people around us to remember things. That's, that's transactive memory. That's when, that's when you were with your partner and, and you, you've, you've been together for 10 years and, and you realize that, you know, he or she remembers a bunch of things and you don't remember them because you're constantly relying on each other to help each other out. And, and, and studies have shown over and over again that groups of people um, that know each other well are collectively smarter and more remo more memorious can remember more than when they are separated and, and they're apart and that's because we have these long mental habits of knowing that our brains are you know my I, I, I guess I can talk about the brain in this regard um, our brains are notoriously terrible at remembering details we're we're, we're very good at remembering meaning we're good at reading a book or a, a, or an article and remembering the gist of the meaning, but we lose the details very quickly, and we've been that way for hundreds of years. That's nothing the internet did to us. Um, what happened for hundreds of years is that to get the details back, most of the time we just didn't have them. You know, like we vaguely remembered something, but we never had the details. Then we got you know paper books, but you know we didn't look at them very often. You know, the Encyclopedia Britannica. People bought the encyclopedia, and you think, well, you've got this resource. Won't you look at it all the time to refresh your knowledge? Not really. It turns out that when they study their users, people look at the encyclopedia on average once a year. You know, because it's kind of a pain in the butt to go to the encyclopedia. It's easier just to ask your friend nearby, and you get kind of maybe a bad answer because they don't really know what they're talking about. Well, now we have these resources near us all the time that have the proximity and speed of access of another person, but they're closer to the encyclopedia in their actual accuracy um, because you know you have we have access to newspapers we have articles we have Wikipedia which you know is is by and large pretty accurate it, despite its despite its its frailties um, and so I think we're actually in this kind of great uh, um, we're in this we're in this really great moment where we're taking all of our historic uh, uh, tools for thinking um, uh, you know th that reside near and proximal and in this dance with our with our minds and we and, and we have more and more than we have these fantastic new ones that are very powerful so I started off being worried about this whole problem of like wow is am I too reliant on this technology and I calmed down by realizing I've always been unbelievably reliant on things outside of my head for the quality of my thought long answer my apologies wow. I'll try I'll try and be quiet I'll try and be shorter next time <laughs> uh, well we're certainly in either intimidating or our audience they're not tweeting at all or they're in shock and awe about what you're saying <laughs> But don't we see a, a currently a, uh, a moving away from details? Because uh, it, from my point of view, details means uh, text. 
And yes. the internet currently uh, is in a state where we see more a picturization, I would say. Sure. So we see via Instagram, via Vine, we see short uh, videos, we see uh, lots of pictures. So is the internet maybe moving away from the idea to have all the details uh, at our hand? Yeah. Um, I don't think so, no. I mean, I actually think what's happening in many ways is an absolute explosion of textual uh, um, uh, information. In fact, we are, uh, uh, just simply on the production side, we are writing uh, more than humanity ever has in history. Uh, um, you know, I, 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 I sort of tried to figure out what the what the kind of metric tonnage of our of our output is every day and so I consulted a bunch of sources the best I could on how much email we write how many um, blog posts we write, how many comments we write, how many things we update on social networks and to the best of my ability I, uh, and it's a very crude estimate I, 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 I tell you here um, but I think, it's a, I think it's a low estimate, I think it's actually much higher I came up with a figure of about three and a half trillion words per day which is the, the equivalent of the, uh, the Library of Congress in the US all their books, that's what that's we, we produce in text a day you know and so I think actually the amount of text we encounter has dramatically gone up up. Uh, the thing that, but you're also correct though. There's a huge amount of expression happening in video and pictures too. Um, but I don't think this is crowding out text uh, necessarily. Uh, um, it's 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 like a more and more. I mean, the one thing that we know from media studies is that y you get this paradox whereby it appears as though uh, people consume more hours of media than they have hours awake and that's because you know uh, uh, our, our our media has become more 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 um, promiscuously surrounding us and so we will encounter things in different modes you encounter text on the television you encounter video and text on your phone um, I, 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 I will I will grant you that you know it is it is definitely possible for societies to lose uh, uh, the tradition of literacy. I mean, it it happened in Europe, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, right? You know, um, it could happen again. Um, but when I talk to all the literacy scholars who've been studying this stuff for a long time, they 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 don't think they they don't really see it happening. Um, textual literacy is still incredibly important um, for navigating everyday life. Uh, the the addition of what you're talking about, um, new forms of visual literacy. The fact that we can now deploy photographs as a way to 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 document our lives, to 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 make a point, to illustrate a point, to have a little playful argument, we can use video for that. Um, that is, those are really interesting new things. Um, and the truth is, actually, if you look, if you look, and it's funny, I'm just writing a piece. I'm just I, this morning, I was writing a little essay about the emoji. You know, so emoji is when you string little pictures together to make in a text. And uh, the funny thing is, it, it's not even a new thing at all. Like if you go back and look at the history of literacy. Um, we always had, from the very beginning, our texts were highly illustrated. You know, eliminated manuscripts in the medieval period. Uh, um, you know, there was there was this long tradition of using imagery along with your pictures uh, to to enhance the um, the cognitive and emotional and spiritual value of what you were writing about, what, how, what you were reading about. And it sort of went away because of the Gutenberg Press, because it was very hard to integrate imagery into movable type because movable type privileged text alone. It was an industrial process. The goal was to um, to produce text quickly and cheaply, and that meant you know less pictures. Um, and so our rich tradition of visual thinking started to vanish with the Gutenberg Press, but it never really went away because people were always delighted um, in in visual thinking. I mean, scientists relied on it. You go back and look at like you know Scientific American and the early journals like Nature, and they have these gorgeous lavish illustrations because that's crucial to understanding what's at hand. Um, the, the difference was the average person in their everyday communications had no way to communicate visually because all, the, all we really had was text. We didn't have any industrial processes cheap enough to allow us to communicate using, using visual imagery. We are now in the process of rediscovering stuff that the average scholar, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, educated elite uh, of the uh, of the period from the birth of text until the Gutenberg press knew and understood um, there I, I think there I, I don't know I I talk about them in my book as new literacies but I don't know entirely where they're headed you know you do see a lot of these very startling um, 
abilities to parse visual information that never no one would have predicted. Like uh, one of the examples in my book is Iran. So uh, you know, Iran puts out this photo a couple of years ago. Uh, um, they 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 launch they they do a missile launch, and to show off how amazing their missile launch is, they put a photo online on the on the official Iran news uh, um, news site, and it has four missiles. Shooting off simultaneously, and everyone freaked out, you know, because they thought, "Oh my goodness, Iran is even more powerful than we thought." And the photo ran on uh, on, on on the New York Times website. It ran on Agence Press Press. It ran it ran in dozens of of, of publications around the world. Um, and uh, uh, but what happened is, as soon as it went online, um, all the collective uh, uh, thinking of people who are visually literate were looking at it, and they were talking about it on blogs. They're going, "Wait a minute." Something seems wrong in this photo. Uh, the, two of the plumes look too similar, and so uh, the, people began doing this very great visual detective work, where they like compare, cut them and compare them. And realize, ah, they'd cut and pasted one of the missiles. There's really only three missiles. Uh, the, it, so in fact, they, they they doctored the photo to make it look as though there was four missiles. No one at the official media noticed this, you know, but. Connected crowds of visually literate people did, and of course the next thing they did was they started mocking it. They put up these mashups. They did like you know giant cats, you know, it looming in behind the missiles. You know, seventy thousand missiles firing in different directions. They were mocking. They were using visual language to mock and parody what the Iranians themselves were trying to pull off. And and the, this, the great thing here is, I mean, this is such an inversion of the history of, of visual literacy over the last hundred years because when when photography and photo manipulation was something that the average person couldn't do, it was a powerful tool for authorities to use to dupe and 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 hoodwink the average public. I mean, Stalin, you know, he like he was a master of photo manipulation, just erasing all of his uh, all of his. Um, he'd kill someone and erase them from a picture, kill someone else, erase them, and he was confident that he could do this because the average person didn't know that photo manipulation was possible. He 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 understood correctly that he could change the record of history, but what and you know what happened now of course is that you know photo editors you know 10 years ago they were very worried about photoshop they thought that it was going to be stalin times 10 that 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 people would be able to lie with impunity in photographs um, but the opposite has happened. Now that it's become something that the average person can sort of tinker with, you know, on their computer, they can play with these little free Photoshop things. They become so much more literate in the way photos can be used and abused um, that you can't get away with this stuff anymore. And over and over again, this happens. Church of Scientology this spring, they tried to they put out a photo showing a huge crowd, you know, a huge adoring crowd outside some Scientology speech, and and uh, people that, that knew the area immediately recognized something was wrong, and they started comparing notes and they discovered that in fact they'd cut and pasted chunks to the crowd to try and make it look larger right and so and that became the next parody thing so 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 I, I think I think what you're saying is true about about there being more visual communication but I don't think it's crowding out text and I think it's going to develop into into literacies that are, can be quite sharp and interesting in ways that we probably can't predict right now another long answer I'll, I'll try and be shorter next time <laughs> let's, let's go back to what you said um, five minutes before um, you compared the length of um, people um, reading, consuming text on the web with the length of um, them consuming uh, visual images. But um, is this comparison even legit? Because, I mean, if we, all, we all know that if we watch a five-minute TV segment, uh, we take up very little information. If we read something in the same time span, we have learned a lot more. So what would be a better way to compare how much information is, is in a time span that we spend with, with a certain, certain media? Um, did I make myself clear? <laughs> Can you hear me? Clive? Uh, Clive is just chatting. The audio just uh, was uh, going out for him. Uh, hopefully he can... Uh, Clive, we can't hear Change you. That. Um, let's see. I'm chatting with you, but I can't hear you. Oh, that's interesting. Um, hmm. That's strange. He can't hear us. We can't hear. You can't hear us. That's strange because we have uh, maybe your. Uh, oh, um, sorry, uh, liebe Zuschauer, wir müssen jetzt gerade mal hier kurz was chatten. Um, uh, 
Okay, äh, er wird jetzt mal kurz rausgehen und nochmal wieder versuchen reinzukommen. Ähm, ähm, und dann wollen wir mal sehen, ob es wieder besser funktioniert. Äh, vielen Dank an Google in diesem Punkt. <lacht> ähm, und wir hoffen, dass es und, besser wird. Aber bisher, bisher muss ich ganz ehrlich sagen, das, das fand ich schon sehr spannend, oder Ulrike? Ja, absolut. Ähm, der, der ist ja ein Feuerwerk an Ideen und an äh, Synapsenschaltungen. Wir müssen ein bisschen aufpassen, dass wir unsere Zuschauer nicht komplett verlieren oder sie, sie werden halt einfach äh, hinterher diesen, diesen wunderbaren ja, Monolog, Diskussion können wir es ja weniger nennen, äh, sich ansehen. Aber im äh, Moment genau. scheinen wir unsere Zuschauer ein bisschen eingeschüchtert zu haben. Er spricht ja nun auch sehr schnell. Das stimmt allerdings, ja. Aber so sind sie halt. Die amerikanischen Journalisten, die dann ja auch sehr äh, Podien äh, erfahren sind, ähm, und ähm, äh, dann ja auch jederzeit wissen, sich entsprechend zu verkaufen, was, ich, was ja eigentlich auch sehr angenehm ist. Ja, ja. Ähm, er gibt einem ja auch keine Chance, irgendwo dazwischen zu gehen und das Wort abzuschneiden. Andererseits will man das ja auch nicht. Das ist auch ziemlich spannend, was er erzählt. Ja, genau so ist es. Und hoffentlich so. ist er hey, bald wieder da. I can hear you again now. Ah, oh, there we go. Great. 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 Okay. Um, Yeah, please go, go back and ask the, the question again. Okay. It was about, um, is it legit to compare uh, the hours that we consume uh, video or um, other types of moving image on the web with the, uh, the hours that we spend consuming text? Because we all know that we can take up much more information in a written text than, let's say, in a uh, five-minute mm. TV segment or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, here, here's the thing. Um, Uh, I think what's happening is, is that I, I used to believe this too. I'm, I'm very text. I'm very text oriented. Um, I'm a writer. Uh, uh, I don't do TV in part because uh, I have this funny experience whereby I, 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 I <laughs> like I write. I write a long magazine article and. Um, And then, uh, and then the article comes out, and often someone from the radio will call and say, "Hey, you know, can um, can we talk to you about the article?" And I go, "Yes," and I'll go on radio and we'll talk about it. And then maybe a TV station will call and say, "Hey, can we, can we, um, you know, can we have you on to talk about the article?" Yes, I go on and talk about it. Now, what happens in these three? I've noticed over the years what happens is, um, is that. Uh, Uh, the person who reads the article will come up to me and say, hey, Clive, I, I read the article you wrote. Uh, that was really interesting. I'll go, oh, what did you think of it? And we have this conversation, and they, they bring up a lot of details. They clearly understood it. And then someone will come to me and say, hey, Clive, I heard you on the radio talking about your article. And I'll go, oh, interesting. You know, what, what did you think of it? And they'll, they'll sort of, you know, they'll remember less than the person who read it in print, but they'll kind of, they'll remember what we talked about. Um, and then someone will come up to me and say, hey, Clive, I saw you on TV talking about your article. And I'll say, um, great, what did you think about it? And they'll say, You look great. Uh, they, 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 don't, they don't remember anything. You know, it, it just went in and out, right? And so for a long time, I had exactly the bias you had, which is that I just thought that visual media, like, like uh, video, were sort of fundamentally unsuited for the communication of serious information, right? Um, but uh, but, th but then, then two things started happening. One is that um, I had these personal experiences, which are quite different. I, I would go to a conference and I would maybe give a talk or something, and someone would come up to me afterwards and they would say, "Oh, you know, can we can we can we take a little video of you for our, our podcast, our video podcast?" I go, "Sure." And you know, they would ask me about something, and I would I would do a little video, three or four minute video, and they would put it on their website. And now, when someone said to me, "Oh, yeah, I saw you." I, I saw that video on YouTube of you talking. I go, well, what do you think about it? And they would they would respond in great detail about what I'd said. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So what's going on? Why are they getting more information out of YouTube? And I and I realize it's because TV it, 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 TV is is something designed just to be sort of in the background of of uh, no one's ever really paying full attention to TV unless there's a real catastrophe on, you know, like uh, and this is what Neil Postman said about uh, about television in his book Amusing Ourselves to Death. He said, you know, you can tell TV is serious when they don't have any of those spinning pictures and uh, arresting music when they just break in and they go, the president has been shot and there's no and they just get right to the chase. That's when you pay attention. Uh, the rest of the time, it's just something on in the background, and people barely notice it. They sort of half pay attention to it. Video online, people are choosing to look at it, and so what was happening was that people were like, you know, they were they were opting to say, "I want to see what this is," and and they and they had it had much more of their attention. So I began to realize that 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 video, depending on how it was used, was actually quite powerful. The second thing that I started realizing, the more I talked to people who who deal with video, documentary makers, thing like that, is that is that um, 
there, you know, there, there are there are types of there are types of information, there are types of knowledge, there are types of uh, of of uh, of, uh, of subject matter that are that are really best suited to each medium. You know, uh, there are things you can grapple with really best in text and only quite poorly uh, in, in say an audio conversation, and not at all uh, with the moving image. Um, there are things that, on the other hand, that are actually types of knowledge that are extremely powerful when you see them and almost impossible to express in text. I mean, I, I remember I was chatting with the, uh, the, 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 the artificial intelligence, uh, 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 um, Neil, Niels Nielsen, I think his name is. Uh, he's in my book, but um, I was chatting with him once 10 years ago when I was writing about um, the attempt to encode common sense knowledge um, in artificial intelligence. And one of the problems is a huge amount of n common sense knowledge is really hard to represent as words. I mean, as he said, you know, I can describe to you how to swing a golf club, but is that really going to show you, you know? So, like, we have this predisposition, people that are text deliverers like me, that if you can't say it in text, how serious an idea can it really be, right? But what we're but that's only because text was the only mode the average person had to communicate to other people and to themselves, right? It was the only way we had not just to talk to other people to organize our thoughts. You know, you wrote notes, but you couldn't use any other modes for those notes. Um, scientists have long understood that there are things which are um, really, really hard to express in text that are extremely wittily and elegantly expressed with the moving image. For example, I have I had read and reread Einstein's book Relativity twice. I had plowed through lots and lots of conversations about relativity and read stuff. And I you know I understood the idea that okay, you know, uh, um, you know, because of the limits of the, of of uh, of the speed of light time has to slow down if you go a, a certain speed, but I never really frankly got it. You know, I mean, I, I, I parodied the knowledge, but I did not embody it. And then, about seven years ago, I went to the American Museum of, the, uh, uh, of Natural History, and they did an exhibit on Einstein. <clears throat> and they had an animation on the wall, a looping animation of Einstein's concept of, the, of, of a moving train where there's mirrors on each side and a light, and a, and a light beam bouncing back and forth. And they showed that you know, if you move it speedily along, the light beam looks like it's tracing this diagonal pattern, and and essentially it 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 appears to be moving faster than the speed of light. And the only way to reconcile that is for time to slow down. And so what I actually saw a, a, a elegantly done visual representation of this that I finally understood what the heck was going. And I'm a science journalist for God's sakes. I've been reading about this stuff for you know 15 years, and it had never really sunk into my mind. I'd read endless texts about this. I'd read Einstein's own descriptions of it over and over again, and it had never been there. And this is when I began to grasp that there are forms of knowledge that we're not accustomed to formalizing because we don't have them. We haven't had that. We haven't had the typewriter for imagery. We haven't had the typewriter for audio. We haven't had the typewriter for video. And I think it's going to take an awfully long time and experimentation to figure figure that out, but that's the path we're on now. We have the ability to communicate uh, ideas in the medium in which they are best expressed, and text is not always going to be the best one. It's going to be the best one for a long time for most things, simply because it, it's an incredibly flexible cognitive tool. Also, we have 3,000 years of practice at it, so we're really good at it. Um, but we're going to be developing <coughs> these new literacies as time goes on. That, that, that's what I think. You, you just mentioned some examples of how transactive memory uh, is, for example, helping uh, to find uh, manipulated pictures, but I would call that rather destructive. Um, yeah. Do you have an uh, example how you have something really uh, uh, innovative and really constructive that came out of transactive memory? Oh my god, I, absolutely, all the time. I mean, like, um, uh, uh, to a certain extent, you know, my own everyday thinking is enormously transactive. Like, like, uh, um, I frequently find myself wondering about something. You know, like frequently in the process of writing something, I am, I, I'm going on my 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 generally remembered inside knowledge. You know, uh, um, when I'm writing something, but. Um, uh, uh, but the moment when I realize I'm stumbling on a detail, I'll do a quick Google search or a quick Wikipedia search. And then a, 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 a shockingly large amount of the time, I find myself getting swept up 
and realizing that the details actually contradict my in-brain knowledge because my, my brain had done what it always does, which is that it sort of shapes a self-satisfying uh, uh, um, version of the information. Um, and 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 this is this is what any brain scientist would tell you. Any scientist in memory would tell you um, our memory is frail, and and we we frequently remember things very poorly. And so the fact that we can now very quickly correct the record in our heads um, is enormously important uh, in the hands of someone who is curious and trying to think clearly. Um, it's no different from uh, from if I kept copious notes all the time of everything I wrote and went back, which I actually also do. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a freak about when I'm reading something, writing down a note about it because that, that's a generation effect. When you, write so, when you write about something, it keeps it in your head. Um, and so I now have this as I wrote this book and as I've just generally done my note collecting, I have about three or 4,000 of these 500 word notes of stuff that I've written about. And so when I'm, when I'm trying to refresh my knowledge on something, when I'm, when I'm, trying to, I'm trying to write about something, I will dip into those and again I'll be confronted with the fact that, oh, it's not quite the way I remember it. You know? now, this, any journalist has always known this, any academic has always known this, but the average person has not had this. They've gone through life working with incomplete information the vast majority amount of the time. So I so so I find it I find it productive in my everyday life. Uh, uh, you know, almost almost so frequently that I've stopped even noticing it. Of you, course, you recently um, you, you recently um, wrote an interesting blog post um, about how we now can overcome the fundamental flaw or um, n negativity of of video. I mean, if we read something or if we look at an image, we can constantly go back and forth and sort the information um, like uh, we want to. But if we watch a video or if we li listen to audio, it passes in real time and a lot of information is lost. But we now right. have video parsing. And you use this example of um, of Walt uh, poisoning Brock, Brock in, <laughs> in uh, Breaking Bag. Uh, bag. Yeah. Can you go um, tell the sure, story sure. of that because that's well, yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I mean, like this is another thing that Neil Postman wrote about mm. um, when he wrote "Amusing Ourselves to Death" in the '80s. Uh, I read it and I and it reinforced everything negative I ever thought about TV. Right? I mean, he was basically talking about how bad TV is. Um, and one of the things he said is the problem with televised information in the news is that there is no way to pause it. There is no way to linger over it. There is no way to review it several times in the way that we linger over and look back over textual information. And that because there was no way to stop it and to look at it and to show it to someone else and compare it and to compare it against another uh, piece of information, it was inherently propagandistic. Um, and I think for the time that he wrote, he was completely correct. I mean, you know, when he wrote this in the early 80s, uh, VCRs were still pretty rare and you couldn't really use them. People, no one knew how to program them. Uh, um, there was always that blinking light on your VCR. Um, but, uh, and so I thought, he, oh my God, he's right. You know, there, there's, you know, video information is doomed to a propagandistic. Uh, um, uh, life, but but then you know when you started to get the advent of of hard disk recorders for video, the TiVo, the other things, you you immediately saw people realizing, oh, now I can I can watch a TV show and I can stop it and I can look at something, I can go back over it a couple times and I can look at it frame by frame, and and so what started happening is that people have become a, a lot of people have become extremely adept. Um, parsers on a frame by frame level of some of their favorite TV shows and 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 so one great example of this was in Breaking Bad so Breaking Bad uh, it's this, this American TV show about uh, a guy who becomes a drug dealer and he builds this big drug empire and at one and at one point in time there's this minor smaller character a little boy who becomes sick he starts at, 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 and people think he's getting poisoned and the discussion boards are just filled with millions of words you know this is again classic public thinking what I talk about in my book millions of words people arguing and trying to figure out how is this kid being poisoned who's doing it and in the middle of this argument um, the, the, this user for YouTube, JCham979, put up this video called uh, 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 A Case for Poisoning Brock, arguing that the main character of the show, Walt, had actually done it. And he, uh, and whoever JCham971, male, female, animal, vegetable, mineral, I don't know, uh, the, the person never stepped forward. They, they, they broke down this crucial scene on a millisecond by millisecond level to show how this transfer of drugs might have actually happened. 
this transfer of risen poison might have actually happened, and and to show the to show the argument, it was this incredibly Talmudic scrutiny of video that I'd really I'd rarely seen before, and it turned out it was completely correct because uh, uh, by the end of the season when you discovered who really did it, the, you know Jane Chan was completely right, and so I looked at this and I thought, oh my goodness, this is what we're starting to see, and it wasn't just there. You saw this with the TV show Lost. The users were constantly doing these screen grabs and these and these and these part taking little chunks of video. You see that uh, you know with all the political TV shows, the comedy political TV shows now that are constantly taking something an utterance that a politician makes you know a few months ago and showing how they're like completely lying to their teeth, or reverse their position. Um, that you know like one one video against another. We're beginning to see this culture of like saying that you know video is a document that we are going to archive. We're going to throw up against another thing. We're going to show how these utterances conflict and move around. And I think we're still in the very, very, very early stages of this. I mean, there's still no way to search video, right? There's still It's still basically like, you know, unless you personally saw the stream and saved it, there's no way to go back and find stuff. We don't even have the very basic simple tools that we have with text. Um, I think as those emerge, we're going to see some very, very interesting things start to happen, um, whereby people will be able to say, you know, I think I remember this, seeing this, or something like this, or having personal stores of visual information. Because here's the other thing I think about that to look to look forward in, in the in in the future of of the literacy in these in these moments is. Um, you know, right now we're still mostly using online. People are still mostly using um, audio, video, data, all these new literacies, pictures to communicate to other people. Right? They're 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 still treating as a broadcast medium, but with text. We use a lot of text to communicate to ourselves. We write notes. We use them to organize our thoughts. We never show it to anyone else. Like if you go into my office, there's a filing cab that's filled with paper that no one else has ever seen. I used it solely to communicate. I wrote notes to communicate not with other people but to communicate with myself, right? Because text is very flexible that way. It's fantastic for taking notes, for ruminating. Um, we still don't have the tools, really, that allow us flexibly to do that with these other media. But I think that you'll be able to see that these new media are becoming mature when people use them, not to communicate with other people, but to communicate with themselves when they use. And you see a little bit of that. I mean, like I've talked, to, I've made this point before, and people said, "Oh, well, I use I use pictures all the time to organize my thinking." Like, you know, whether that's people who need need to take pictures of things that they're thinking about. You know, obviously in the art world, they've used this for a long time in a lot of industries like fashion they have, but people on their everyday basis have started saying, you know, I take pictures of things to try and remind myself of them, and I've begun doing this myself. Like, I'm a journalist, so I go, I'm a, I'm a magazine journalist, so I write these long stories, and one of the things I have to do is describe in print what something looked like, how someone talks, how they move. This is an important part of my job, and in sort of bringing this stuff to life, and I used to just frantically try and jot down notes of what, how, what does this person sound like when they talk, and now I've started actually building up these corpuses of, I was just r reporting about quantum computers for Wired, so I was, I was in Burnham BBC looking at this quantum computer, and I I was jotting all my notes and my impressions, but I was also taking a lot of pictures and video, and not for the purpose of showing them to anyone else. They're merely for me to linger over, to re-inhabit those moments, and try and, and and try and and see different aspects of stuff that I wouldn't have necessarily seen in the here and now to make my reporting better. So that's kind of the beginnings of that movement when a media becomes something you use to communicate to yourself. But it's still incredibly crude. It might take decades, even centuries, for us to really figure out what these things are good for. Now, uh, you just mentioned Breaking Bad and, and the, the passion of the fans of such TV shows. Yeah. But of course, that plays into the arguments of people who say, okay, this, this whole internet thing, uh, it's all about just uh, analyzing yeah. fiction. Um, companies dream about creating real innovations and, and doing crowdsourcing uh, to, to uh, really create something new. Um, do you see uh, this as just a minor trend, or uh, could it be that that more people become uh, real inventors and not just innovators? You know, in a, yeah. I mean, are you asking whether the innovations we're seeing are just silly, you know, sort of pop cultural things as opposed yeah, to like exactly. serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, I think the answer there is that. Um, is is that I'm not really th I don't think I don't think we're seeing any net increase in people's uh, um in, in people's obsessions with things that we regard silly or trivial. Um, I think it was always there. We just couldn't see it. What the internet and what digital tools have done is they've ex they they've made people's 
conversations and passions visible. And we used to, intellectuals, myself included, uh, if I can call myself an intellectual, incredibly uh, uh, crass thing to do, but what the hell, uh, I'm a journalist. Journalists and, and thinkers and scholars, I think, flattered themselves for a long time that that the nation was sort of unified behind caring about the same five or six books, or the same five or six political issues, or the same five or six important things. Um, but that was always a self-flattering myth, frankly. Uh, um, and what they've, what's happened with the internet is not that it has created any particularly new obsession with um, things that we might consider silly or trivial. It simply exposed what was already there. Um, we've made the conversation visible, and it's freaking us out, right? So that's the first part. I don't think it's actually increased any. In fact, like it, it, you know, I often talk to people who are like, "Wow, you know, I remember the old days before the internet when people talked about you know politics all the time." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. We didn't do that before the internet." Um, Robin Dunbar. Uh, you know, a famous anthropologist of, uh, of of language, you know, hired a bunch of grad students to follow people up and down Britain and listen to what they were talking about. And he wanted to basically figure out, you know, and this is back in the 80s, before the internet, he wanted to find out what do people talk about, you know, in everyday life. And it turns out that the amount that they talk about politics and religion put together is 2.9 percent of the time, right? So you know, so of course, you know, the, the elites are obsessed with talking about political issues and governance and policy, but the average person never cared much about that stuff. It's all. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I think it's. I think it's incumbent upon us. That's why one of the reasons why I write about science is to try and make this stuff interesting. Please God, I would like more people to talk about this serious stuff. Um, but I don't think. I think we're fooling ourselves if we think there was this wonderful period 20 years ago when everyone walked around. Uh, with these high, uh, higher notions in their heads. Um, the second point here I would make is that things that seem trivial uh, or seem or seem to seem to be used for a silly purpose often become much more complex and interesting when you look closely at them. So um, Ravelry, uh, uh, Ravelry is my favorite example. So Ravelry is a is a social network devoted to knitting. Uh, um, and there's about half a million people in there talking about knitting, and they and they set it up because knitters love to share stuff. They're like, you know, here's a pattern I made. I'm going to send it. Let everyone try it out. Show me what you did. Post some pictures. Let's talk about what's good, you know, bad here. And you know, knitters were often a little isolated. They didn't have anyone around them who cared as much about this as they did. So they have this, they love being able to go there and 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 just sort of talk about this stuff. But you know, along the way, they wind up getting in very interesting conversations about things like politics and about things like uh, the economy. Because when you get a bunch of like-minded people together that share a passion, they find there's other interesting things to talk about. Same thing with UB Mom. There's this there's this forum that that my wife started going to after our baby was born. It's it's an anonymous forum for mothers just to complain about their about their children and their and their and their and their married life. Um, and so it's very funny and it's very acerbic. Um, but it turns out that they don't just talk about their kids and their and their and their and their and their and their boring husbands. They end up getting in all these conversations about the economy and about um, culture and about books. Um, because once they're all in that place, something that looks like it's there for a purely trivial purpose sort of explodes in other uses. And we see this over and over again. Over in Korea, you know, the um, the the, uh, the discussion boards devoted to the to the Korean boy band uh, turned out to be the most important place. For the for the rallying of opposition to uh, uh, to the to the lifting of the of the of the of the ban on U.S. beef, so the U.S. had you know had a mad cow scare you know five or six years ago, and all these countries said yeah no more U.S. beef, and in beef you know Korea it, beef is a big is a big food uh, very important food culturally important food, and so when when the U.S. when the Korean government said okay South Korea we're going to let American beef back in the country, um, they suddenly got this massive explosion of protest. People saying, "No, we don't want this." And when when the people who had studied the protest looked at where it came from, a huge amount of it came from this discussion board devoted to this teenage boy band. Because for some reason, they started talking about this, and they got up ahead of steam about this, and they all decided to organize around this. So, so the um, so I think in some respects, the all the things that we think are going to be purely silly. Wind up being less so, uh, less less obviously so. That, that's my two-part answer. Uh, again, another long one. I, I wish, I'm sorry. I wish I was asked, ask, answering more concisely here. This is why no one's tweeting. I'm boring them to death. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They're all fascinated. But we are running out of time. Um, how about Thomas? Uh, we each ask one last question. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Ladies first. Um, okay, I would like to go back to um, Evgeny Morozov. We talked about him briefly in the beginning. 
Um, one idea of which I find fascinating is um, his talk about solutionism. He says yeah. that um, the Silicon Valley comes up with uh, gadgets. To every yep. problem they think they can think of, there's a gadget or a tool or yep. a platform, but this doesn't solve basic human problems like pollution, diseases, poverty, yep. global warming. Yep. What do you think of that? I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I, I think I think that there, there's two points. To this one is that is that um, uh, solutionism uh, I I in Silicon Valley is basically uh, creating, uh, uh, real deciding. Okay, well, we can do this. We you know we, we can find a way to have people you know uh, uh, um, you know hail cabs you know from their you know from their from their mobile phone. Uh, um, so let's do it. Uh, and then, then, and that app comes out, and everyone thinks it's great. Except that you know, it actually there's already an existing system, a very complex, you know, negotiated labor system in most cities. Uh, uh, most of the ta taxi fleets are unionized, and they've been, and they've spent decades, sort of, you know, working on this, you know, so that there's this uneasy balance between the needs of the cab drivers to make a decent amount of money and the needs for the city to have enough cabs. And then, uh, and the along comes this solutionist uh, um, company saying, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna create destroy this entire thing well maybe you know not everything should be creatively destroyed you know particularly in areas where pu public policy uh, uh, you know is actually the more appropriate way to grapple with things um, and so I think he's absolutely right that like there's this there's this idea that that every problem uh, should be solved even if it isn't actually a problem that's a really interesting part of his argument is that like some problems or some things that seem like they're inefficient are inefficient for a good reason right in fact part of the goal of government is to make certain things less efficient because if we did it completely efficiently it, it would destroy human lives I mean that's one for of the example reasons we well, the free market, for example, you know, we 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 regularly, you know, we put all sorts of brakes on the free market uh, to prevent it from going absolutely haywire uh, and 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 um, causing social instability when entire industries get 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 demolished overnight. You know, in Silicon Valley, it's considered great to have an industry get demolished overnight. Um, but uh, but that's 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 one that's one thing where I'm mean, I'm Canadian. I'm strongly in favor of regulating the free market. So 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 that's his first point. His second point, which is very subtle, which I think is great, is that um, a lot of a lot of the focus of of software, including things like Facebook, have been about um, optimizing uh, sort of understanding the psychology of people so that you can tweak it right um, and as he points out there's been too much psychology and not enough philosophy too much you know trying to tweak people's behavior to sort of sell more ads and not enough of this thinking well what are the real problems that we ought to be focusing on these that's a philosophical question and that would lead you to much larger social problems again like the environment so that I, I so I, I'm with him on that absolutely uh, why don't we move to, to your question Tomas so that we can we can get done by the time the hour is out <laughs> yeah, um, I'm. I'm still interested about this whole innovation thing, and I was wondering, did you make out any rules uh, that uh, help to really make collaboration uh, work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When when people here, I, I I investigated a lot of collaborative thinking online because the funny thing is you have these you have collaborations that work very well. You know, like the early days of Wikipedia. Less so now. They're actually kind of slowing down because they've got a bureaucracy in place. The early days of Wikipedia, great collaboration, produced an enormous amount of value. Um, then you get all sorts of other things that just don't work at all. Uh, here in the U.S., there was uh, when 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 Boston was bombed. Um, you know, Reddit set up this thread to try and identify the bombers completely misidentified the wrong people and so you instead of collective wisdom you saw collective stupidity right so we I wanted to figure out what are the ways that collective wisdom actually flourishes online and it turns out there's a there's a, you know there's some basic rules you know if you want to try and get people together to 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 help solve a problem to do something creative to think of a of an interesting solution to something um, you have to have a very specific goal um, you have to have a range of contributors you have to have some people that are doing a lot and and then you have to encourage a lot of people to come in and just do one little thing. And the really interesting one is that you have to have not too much communication between the people who are collectively working online, because if everyone is constantly just li just like staring at the at the forum and, and looking at what's going on, they get you know you get that sort of um, 
that, that, that sort of a sea swell around the first bad idea. And this happens all the time in the real world. You go to a, a meeting at work and they get, we're going to, we're going to, everyone throw out their ideas and someone loudly throws out a bad idea and everyone just goes, okay, yeah, that's a good one. Let's go with that. You know, the first loud idea is the one that we seize on. So to architect really good collaborations online, there needs to be a way for, to encourage people to think independently and then share their, their thought with the group only after they've had some time to think about it independently, right? And, 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 and in some respects, that's what the best, that's what the best um, online collaborations do. You, you know, at its best, Wikipedia is people thinking, in doing their research individually, coming together and pooling it, you know? Um, at its best, you have things like what NASA has done uh, with Galaxy, actually it's not NASA, I think it's the University Galaxy Zoo, where they, they break a problem, how to map this galaxy into little pieces and let everyone contribute a little piece. But it's not contingent upon them corroding each other's, you know, insights with bad ideas. So those are that those are really the and, and it's very interesting watching these rules emerge because um you know for a long time I think people had this idea that there was just sort of magic, you know, online. It, it sort of you know these 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 smart things emerge out of nowhere. And what we're learning over and over again is that there actually are interesting social rules just as there are in the real world that help govern what happens online. Thank you so much, Clive. Um, that was one of the most interesting digital quarters I think we ever had. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, we, we really enjoyed it that you joined us uh, for this hour. Um, come to Germany. We'd love to see you here. I, I really hope to. In fact, I'm trying to. I'm we're trying to get my book sold in Germany because I would love to come and uh, and talk there. I mean, I've, every time I've been there uh, for stories, uh, I've encountered just such amazing uh, thinkers and creators. Uh, so absolutely, if if I if I get a chance to come there, I will be the first people to be in touch with you guys. Great. So uh, thanks to New York. Vielen Dank nach Seattle. Um, das war das digitale Quartett Ausgabe 51. Uh, see you soon. Tschüss und bye bye. Tschüss. Take care. Goodbye.